so tonight's the what did I say before? <laughs> tonight's the fifth week of our Tuesday uh, Dhamma study. Saturday and Tuesday are a little bit out of sync just now. Um, and this is the third chapter on Four Noble Truths that you all reviewed and you read uh, the article on the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta. Everyone. <laughs> um, so we started with an introduction. The first week's study was on the, the meditation method that the Buddha taught, the only one that he taught for his entire 45-year teaching career, Shamatha Vipassana, uh, for a very specific purpose to, to deepen concentration. The word the Buddha used for meditation was jhana, which means to deepen concentration. So this is a con the meditation factor of the Eightfold Path is a concentration practice. And that concentration practice then supports the refined mindfulness necessary to do what we're going to talk about tonight. The next week, we went, we spent two weeks on the Satipatthana Sutta, the four foundations of mindfulness, where the beginning portion of that sutta is the Buddha's teaching on meditation, to be mindful of the breath and the body, not be distracted by feelings and thoughts. And when you find that you are, simply recognize that and come back to the sensation of breathing, and then to be mindful of the present quality of your mind. And what this very refined type of mindfulness that the Buddha taught is a way of developing an impersonal relationship with what's occurring within us. In other words, rather than reacting to feelings and thoughts and having that reaction to feelings and thoughts because we're taking them personally affect the quality of my mind, meaning resulting in a distracted or agitated mind, by me simply recognizing that feelings and thoughts arise and pass away, just like everything else in the world, then my mind remains calm and at peace. And if not, it's just as important to recognize that. So you hear me say often that we should strive to be at peace, peace with less than peaceful mind states. That's referring to the fourth foundation of mindfulness as well. If we find ourselves agitated in any way, and agitation could be an extreme excitement over, I'm picking up my brand new Ferrari tomorrow. When I'm thinking about that, I'm not, by the way. When I'm thinking about that, I'm out of my body, aren't I? And I'm in the future. So even though it, it might be exciting and feel good, it's just a distraction. In fact, it, it really is an imagination, even though it might prove to be true. So we learn to concentrate our minds and then to hold in mind the entire Eightfold Path. The second talk on the Four Foundations of Mindfulness address what to do with a well-concentrated mind to be mindful of the five hindrances, the five clinging aggregates, the six sense base, the seven factors of awakening, which relate directly to the Four Noble Truths, which is the last theme of, that, of the Satipatthana Sutta that the Buddha said we hold in mind. Mindfulness means to recollect or to hold in mind. So he takes us from a meditation practice, proper meditation, the four foundations of mindfulness, and concludes the sutta with this is what we hold in mind. And that leads to tonight's talk, um, and so the setting is important here too. Excuse me. You've heard me say this quite often, but it's important to, to reiterate it and emphasize it. This is the very first teaching that Buddha ever gave. And this and what he awakened to, dependent origination, provides the context for everything else he would teach. Excuse me. In fact, the major problem and the major misunderstandings of what the Buddha taught and how's that, how, how that has developed into very contradictory and confusing practices is because the rest of the suttas that the Buddha taught are, are they're fractionated, meaning the little sections of ta are taken out of the context of even the sutta disregarding dependent origination for noble truth and making an entire Dhamma practice over these little pieces and fractions of what the Buddha taught. And the only way to develop the Buddha's Dhamma and to properly apply any of the suttas that he taught is to be able to hold in mind and understand dependent origination and four noble truths. Um, so this, this sutta, this is the very first sutta. He gave this sutta to the, uh, to the five friends that he had been wandering around Northern India with the, pre the previous six years, all seeking enlightenment and all having basically the same experiences. They studied with the same teachers. They found out what, they, what wasn't working for them and disregarded them. Uh, just prior to this, 
the Buddha left his five friends out of frustration. He, it, it wasn't working. And he was wandering down um, a street in, or not a street, a road, a dirt road uh, in Isipatana. And he passed out from malnutrition. He was practicing very severe asceticism. asceticism. Uh, he was eating, it's, it's said that he ate one bean or one grain of rice a day. And he was so emaciated and weakened that he passed out walking on a road. He rolled off the road down into a, the edge of a river. And a young girl, uh, Sujata, 12 years old, dragged him out of the river, saved his life, and nursed him back to health by giving him gruel with you know, rice, and et cetera. Um, as he came, as he started regaining his health, he realized what he would now describe to his friends as a middle way between these extreme views. And remember, the Buddha was, was born a prince in his father's kingdom. He had every luxury lavished on him uh, until he left at the age of 29, left the palace. And so he had that extreme of complete and constant sensory indulgence, feeding every desire he ever had. And he found that lacking. I mean, he left that position of wealth and power because it wasn't satisfying to him. And he, he noticed for the first time in his life when he left the palace grounds, the suffering inherent in the world, just observing people. And then he lived that life of asceticism for many years. It almost killed him. And so he lived that other extreme view, didn't he, of complete um, sensory deprivation and depriving his own basic needs and basic human needs. That's the other extreme that he addresses here. So now he's awakened. He, upon his awakening, he sat in meditation off and on for another two weeks, considering if it was possible to actually teach what he now understood in a way that human beings could understand it. Because he understood at a very profound le le label, level <laughs> the nature of ignorance. And that it is a compulsion of a mind rooted in ignorance to create very powerful but subtle strategies to continue to ignore its own ignorance. In a word, that's, his, that's this constant distraction with self, with eye making. And so considering this carefully, what he knew about the nature of ignorance, how could he teach what he now understood about this nature of ignorance in a way that would get past that, that would pierce the veil of ignorance? And he realized this eightfold path as the framework and guidance for recognizing and abandoning ignorance. And so this is what the Buddha wanted to teach. He wanted to teach people to recognize and abandon the cause of their own suffering is rooted in ignorance. And he taught a singular path on recognizing that and putting it aside. He taught nothing else. And again, everything that he taught was taught in, in relation and in context of dependent origination and four noble truths. So the Buddha now decided that he can teach. And there's a little bit more of a story in that that I won't get into tonight. And he decided, okay, I'm going to go teach. He got up off his his bed of, of leaves and twigs and just started walking. And this, these people that he first met, his, his friends, are not really his first teaching. There was another gentleman who, who he encountered in this first walk. And to make that story a little quicker, um, the gentleman saw the Buddha's countenance and said, who's your teacher? And the, and the Buddha went on and said, I have no there's no one that teaches me. I am the teacher. And it was a kind of a long exchange. And this first gentleman kind of poo-pooed him. He says, nah, you're, you're not the real thing. The Buddha walked a little further. And there's those five friends. They're sitting up on a hill and they're noticing their ex-buddy, Siddhartha, walking towards them. And they decide that we're going to shun the Buddha because he's left us. He's living this luxurious life, meaning he's eating gruel. He's eating a little bit of food that can sustain him. Uh, and he's not sleeping out in the open and he's not uh, walking around naked, which was common at the time. He said, so he's not one of us anymore. We're going to shun him. But as the Buddha got closer, they realized just by looking at his countenance and his calm demeanor that he must have something. So he encounters these five friends. They decide after a little bit of an exchange that they're going to listen to him. The sutta begins with, I have heard on this occasion, the Buddha was staying at Varanasi in the game, root, game refuge at Isipatana. There he addressed a group of five. There are these two extremes that are not to be indulged in by one who has gone forth. Gone forth means someone, in, in a literal sense, it means someone who has left behind all worldly entanglements and joined a spiritual community, but it's just the same as we're doing. We, are, we have gone forth in 
leaving our own entanglements with the world and our own ignorance of what's occurring and are seeking understanding. Which are these two? And this describes the Buddha's life before he, he started seeking understanding and the struggles of asceticism post that. That which is devoted to sensual pleasure with reference to the sensual objects. This behavior is base, vulgar, common, ignoble, and unprofitable. It is devoted to self-affliction, meaning the results of even that lavish life ends up in self-affliction. Then the other extreme view is that which is devoted to self-affliction and is always painful and ignoble. Avoiding both of these extremes is the middle way that is realized by the Tathagata, the Buddha is referring to himself. The Tathagata means one who has gone forth. So he's telling his friends, I have realized this middle way between those two extreme views. They understand what he's saying because they were engaging in the same type of practice. There is a the common belief during that time in India, and it's very common today, is that this, these practices of severe asceticism is a way of freeing the mind from the body and so somehow seeing that as awakening. And again, that's just, that's just as common today, that there's a problem with a mind united in the body. Let's find a way to free that mind from the body. And if you did that, you won't be prone to sensory indulgences and you won't feel pain. It's just a misunderstanding, isn't it? Because the Buddha taught a way to unite the mind and the body and keep it there. A complete contradiction to this life of severe or severe asceticism and complete sensory indulgence. Right? Buddha continues, this middle way leads to calm, to direct knowledge, to self-awakening, to unbinding. Again, he's talking to friends who kind of understand where he's coming from because they had the same practice. Unbinding from what? Unbinding from views that would drive you to these extreme experiences in life. Unbinding from wrong views. And what is this middle way realized by the Tathagata that brings vision and direct knowledge that leads to calm, to self-awakening, and to unbinding? Now remember, you've heard me say this often. This is the first time in human history, but first time for these five fellows to hear this. The middle way is precisely this noble eightfold path. Right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right meditation. Again, the word right um, implies a right and wrong, implies a, an appropriate or inappropriate method. It implies skillful or unskillful, but using the word right is the most direct way to saying that there is such a thing as wrong view, wrong intention, wrong speech, wrong action, wrong livelihood, wrong effort, wrong mindfulness, which is important today, and wrong meditation, because most of the spiritual teachers of the Buddha's time taught different meditation practices that the Buddha mastered very quickly and abandoned them because they weren't leading to his goal. They were wrong meditation as far as the Buddha's Dhamma was concerned. This is the middle way realized by the Tathagata that brings vision and direct knowledge to what we're looking for, direct knowledge, not something magical, mystical, or um, bestowed on us because we've done enough prayers or enough vows, etc. Direct knowledge. We have this knowledge ourselves through the Eightfold Path. Direct knowledge that leads to calm, to self-awakening and unbinding. That's the goal, is developing a calm and peaceful mind and being unbound from views rooted in ignorance of the way things are. Nothing magical or mystical, not, nothing um, superhuman, nothing even but terribly extraordinary, except it's awakening. It's developing a mind that is united in its body and a way to keep it there, to live a, a, a human life moment by moment from a mind rooted in common peace. And I'll add, satisfied continually simply because they are able, this, this human being now is able to stay united in his mind, united with his mind and his body moment by moment. And that changes everything. Then each and every experience of our life is meaningful. Why? Because we're finally present for it. Skip ahead, skip through some comments. This is something the Buddha says repeatedly, describing what he teaches. And it's hard to understand how we, we could get so confused if we follow this one statement. I teach the truth of stress or dukkha, suffering, and the truth of the path leading to the cessation of stress, the Eightfold Path, 
nothing more. So while it is, I think, the most profound and important teachings ever, they're simple and direct, and they're really on one subject, understanding the nature of suffering. But really, when we get into it, it's really a, it's understanding the nature of our contributions to suffering. Because it's our contributions that are to suffering that continue to distract us and exacerbate the suffering that's it's simply a part of having a human life by reacting to that. I teach stress, I teach the cessation of stress, the path leading to the cessation of stress, and nothing more. Then the Buddha teaches, this is the first noble truth, this is the noble truth of stress. Birth is stressful, aging is stressful, death is stressful, sorrow, regret, pain, distress, and despair are stressful. What's he describing? He's simply saying, as a consequence of having a human life, there's stress involved. Birth, sickness, aging, and death are stressful. We get in trouble because we fight against it. We don't accept that this is simply a part of life. And he continues, furthermore, association with the unbeloved, with, with, not, with what is not wanted or, 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 or having experience with people we'd rather not. Furthermore, association with the unbeloved is stressful. And separation from what is loved, what we desire, is stressful. Not getting what is craved for is stressful. In short, the five clinging aggregates are stressful. The Buddha concludes that always with that statement of the five clinging aggregates, form, feeling, perceptions, mental fabrications, and consciousness. But remember, this is consciousness, which is ongoing thinking rooted in ignorance of four noble truth. It's not some grand cosmic consciousness or some unity consciousness. This personal experience of suffering, the five clinging aggregates are what we gain insight into and eventually abandon. Let me just join us. Let's see who that is. Hi, Sarah. Um, in short, the five clinging aggregates are stressful, meaning that if your mind is rooted in ignorance, your life experience as five clinging aggregates is going to be stressful. Another useful word for stressful suffering, disappointment is an unsatisfactory nature because a mind rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths is always grasping at more, no matter what it has. It's never satisfied. That's the ongoing stress that we all have. Every situation, every experience has disappointment built in because even the things that give us pleasure at some point due to impermanence are gonna change, including when we're well, we're gonna become sick. When we're young, we're gonna become old. When, we, when we're enjoying our years, eventually they're going to come to an end. In every human life, that's part of it, isn't it? And every part of human life has disappointment. We're not going to get what we want all the time. We're going to be in situations where we're with people we'd rather not be. And at times, we're going to get too much because it's going to distract us too much in that sense. And no matter how much we get, a mind rooted in ignorance, prone to self-identification, eye-making, wants more. It's never enough. And so our, we spend our entire lives distracted by getting what we think we need to be happy and fulfilled and satisfied in a possible task and avoiding anything that might take away from that satisfaction. And so we spend our entire lives out of our bodies. And this monks is a noble truth of the origination of stress, the craving that makes for further becoming and accompanied by passion and delight in that further becoming. Relishing now here and now there by craving for sensual pleasure, craving for becoming, and craving for non-becoming. I won't get too deep into that. But it's just this constant need for self-establishment in everything that's occurring, in every thought, word, and idea that arises. Relishing now here and now there by craving for sensual pleasure, craving for becoming, craving for non-becoming, these are my words, means com a compulsive need to establish a self rooted in ignorance in every thought, word, and idea. Here, there, we, no matter where we think of ourselves, whether it's yesterday, 63 years ago, tomorrow, the next minute, five years in the future, but tomorrow at work, that's establishing myself here, there, and everywhere else, instead of right here. Refined mindfulness and a well-concentrated mind. This is what's occurring. And this, monks, is a noble truth of the cessation of stress 
The remainderless fading and cessation, the renunciation, the relinquishment, the release, and the letting go of that very craving. The whole point of the Dhamma. The end craving for continued self-establishment in the world. And so what happens when I'm not craving for anything in this moment? Think about that. Think about the quality of your mind. Just for a moment, where there's nothing that you want. You're not craving after or desiring anything. What would, the, what would your mind feel like? Answers. It's at peace. I mean, it's calm. Yeah. That's, that's awakening. And isn't it wonderful that we have the, uh, the ability within us, nothing special, to develop that no matter what's occurring in our life. We can maintain that mind resting in equanimity, calm and at peace, and free of the need for not anything to be any different than what it is, including other people, including ourselves. Excuse me. That sounds like a key to happiness, isn't it? Being able to do that. Well, would you think, you'd have to be very mindful that because you have nothing in your mind, that you'd have to be mindful that you'd have, nothing. You'd, you'd have no feelings or thoughts or anything to be conscious you, of for you, you not to know there's nothing there you you probably will be absence of feelings and thoughts and even absence of calmness no, no. <laughs> uh, a human a, an awakened human being still has feelings and thoughts they're simply not taking personal right and there's no continued eye making there's no distraction no, that's not what you asked pardon me you, that's not what you asked you said how would it be if you had no feelings and thoughts? And that's what you said. Is that how I asked it? Did I ask it yeah. that way? Yeah. You were you craving no, after yeah. anything. Yeah, no craving. Yeah. Yes, not, not wanting more. That's right. not wanting craving. more. Yeah, that was, that, that's, not having, that's not having no feelings. That's having a mind that is resting in peace without the need for anything in that moment. Anything. Not, not more, not less, not it doesn't matter. So it, it really without the need for right. yes without the need the need because arises from self-reference there oh yeah you're and and so what what this is describing is a way of of really for the literally the first time in our lives to feel something as it actually is mm -hmm. without my explanation in my own mind, my description, my analysis, or my need to this for this to be any different. Do you see the difference? Yeah. It's it's rather subtle at first, but when it's developed, excuse me, it's the most profound experience we can have. And we've all had this experience, even if it's momentarily. I mean, that's a true statement, right, Lorna? Mm -hmm. That we've had the experience, and I would write everyone, even mm -hmm. Kate. Even if it's just a brief moment of free of craving and clinging to those these old views, that's freedom. That's awakening. That's the that's the fourth level of jhana that most of us experience nearly every meditation session, whether we realize it or not. That's why it's important to, to recognize that. And it's important, it's one of the reasons why the Buddha teaches this way, so that we know what to recognize as developing this path towards awakening. Oh, I'm sitting here thinking, uh, practicing, practicing restraint and being okay with the middle way. I used to be really mm -hmm. kind of addicted to adrenaline, yeah. adrenaline rush. And that's not really present anymore. Like, I'm not going to say I don't get excited about something, but it's, um, I'm practicing restraint. Yeah, again, most people don't want to ever hear that, especially if someone doesn't understand the Dhamma. What do you mean restraint? My life is all about getting everything I can, isn't it? And we're kind of taught that, that that's the game of life is to get as much, as much toys as you get before you go. And of course, that's ultimately, it's not ultimately, it's continually disappointing because you can never get enough, there's always more. But when you're coming from that mind state of acquisition, you can never satisfy it. But when we understand that life isn't, a, life isn't to be taken personal, so there's nothing for me to gain by adding more to me, then I can be at peace with who, I, who and what I am. 
and I don't need to be anything different than what the Buddha described in the Datu Vibhanga Sutta, these six properties that make up every human being. Because it's all, it's all that I am and it's all that I can ever be is the four elements, earth, wind, fire, and liquid or water, the space property, and the sixth property of consciousness, meaning the thinking that either manifests the other properties in a realistic way or corrupts them and creates five clinging aggregates out of something that shouldn't be done because it's rooted in ignorance. I'm adding more to me. That's a good phrase. Yeah. And why would I need to? I mean, <laughs> think, get, get, look, getting into, and I, I try to avoid this quite a bit, but you can't really avoid psychology completely. In other words, some people overemphasize the Buddha's or mindfulness as a psychological practice. It's not really that, but in this sense, there's some psychology here, isn't there? The, in the psychology of eye making. And when I'm stuck in it, everything I do seems right. And I mean, it, we have extreme examples of people A self-referential ego self, despite all evidence to the contrary, always thinks it's right, even when it causes suffering for itself. It's always defending itself. And we have extreme examples of that, don't we, in, in, in society? But a in, in normal average human being is simply stuck in this ignorance and doesn't even understand there's another way to look at the world. Why? We, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Because unless you actually look at the reason why you are disappointed or your life isn't completely satisfying, you'll never come across a framework to see it differently, will you? If our lives, if our lives were seemingly just wonderful and, and nothing, uh, nothing was troubling us at any point, we wouldn't be here tonight. Something drove us to look for some, something more than it's just the way we're living our lives. And some people look to drugs and alcohol. That didn't work for me, so I kept looking. And I'm fortunate that I could keep looking. Uh, some people substitute uh, pick sex, drugs, rock and roll, um, spending, buying too many clothes, spending too much time on a golf course. Pick, you know, pick your compulsion. But we all have something that we use to distract ourselves and feel that we're entitled to it. Why? Because it's what I'm thinking about. It's what I want but it leads to a, a, a completely unfulfilled and disappointing life that the Buddha recognized is the essence of suffering, the essence of ignorance. So he taught a way to recognize the eye making and put it aside. To live in a, a completely impersonal life while being deeply and meaningfully engaged with life as life occurs. It almost sounds like a paradox, but it's the only way to do it. Did I get to the root of what you were talking mm -hmm. about too? So the Buddha is describing a Four Noble Truth here. And this, monks, is a noble truth of the way of practice, leading to the cessation of stress, precisely this Noble Eightfold Path. And I'm all going through the, each factor again. And then he says, vision arose, insight arose, discernment arose, knowledge arose, illumination arose within me with regards to things never heard before. It's such an important line. And when I read it, um, I can still remember where I was when I read it. It, it almost knocked me off my seat. Actually, I was sitting on the floor. Because I was told repeatedly in modern Buddhism that this Eightfold Path, actually it was often referred to as just the Buddha's teachings, are ancient teachings that the Buddha simply brought back to life in his lifetime. And every Buddha going back to the endless Buddhas in the past and all the future Buddhas going on into the endless future all teach this path. So the Buddha says this is something never heard before. And that's important because it, it is something that was never heard before and unfortunately not heard that often since, even in modern Buddhism. Let me go back, put it in, in context. Vision arose, insight arose, discernment arose, knowledge arose, illumination arose within me with regards to things never heard before. Dukkha occurs. <laughs> I laugh a little bit because all, big build up to that, suffering occurs. Why is that? Such, why did it take an awakened human being, his own awakening, to point that out? That stress occurs. Because he's trying to impress on all of us, anybody that would learn from him, that it is, he could, he, let me say it this way, he could nearly as accurately describe the first noble truth 
as saying stress occurs as saying the preoccupation or the distraction of stress is the problem because it is our preoccupation with always getting what we want and always avoiding what we don't want eye making the essence of eye making that is a distraction from our own life it's what distracts our mind from our body we're either in the past or the future or we're in that ambivalent state which is which is just another um, way of eye making and abandoning ignorance i don't want to get too deep into that is everybody following me so far mm-hmm. not i mean this this is these are the simple four noble truths what the buddha awakened to things that never heard before dukkha occurs stress occurs first noble truth the buddha continues vision arose insight arose discernment arose knowledge arose illuminate illumination arose within me with regards to things never heard before he's reiterating it to his remember the setting he's telling his friends that this is something you've never heard before either all those studies of the, or the past six years with all those different teachers and all the practices that we did you've never heard this before Tell them to pay attention. The noble truth of stress is to be understood. That's the whole point of the Dhamma. Stress occurs. The point of the Dhamma and the point of a fulfilling human life is to understand the nature of stress. The noble truth of stress is to be understood. He's also describing his own thought process of awakening. So first he realizes that stress occurs as a consequence of having a human life. Then the next part of this is to understand that. It makes sense, wouldn't it? And that gaining insight into stress is the, is gaining insight into the three marks of existence, the impermanence of all things and not self characteristic and the resulting stress from a misunderstanding of those first two. The Buddha continues, vision arose, insight arose, discernment arose, knowledge arose, illumination arose within me with regards to things never heard before. He's describing his own process. The noble truth of stress has been understood. I figured it out. That's what the Buddha is saying to his friend. The noble truth of stress has been understood. He's now qualifying himself to his friends that all the things that they've been looking for all those years, was rooted in a wrong view, meaning they were looking in the wrong place. And just like that, I don't get it, there's a good joke about that, but if you're looking where something can't be found, you'll never find it. So they were looking in practices and rituals that couldn't produce this understanding. The Buddha through Siddhartha Gautama realized that the problem is that stress occurs and that we don't understand it. And I figured out a way to understand it. The truth of stress has been understood. He continues, vision arose, insight arose, discernment arose, knowledge arose, illumination arose within me with regards to things never heard before. This is the truth of stress. He was describing the second noble truth and his understanding of coming to understand that. This is a noble truth of the origination of stress. This noble truth of the origination of stress is to be abandoned. Craving and clinging, craving for and clinging to self referential views, views rooted in ignorance of four noble truths, is to be recognized and abandoned. This noble truth of the origination of stress has been abandoned. He's describing the process. We first have to recognize what is to be abandoned, and then we abandon it. Is this clear? Mm -hmm. He's teaching his buddies, this is how you do it. This is how we do it. And this is the same Dhamma that we're doing that the Buddha first taught 2,600 years ago in the Sutta. Vision arose, insight arose, discernment arose, knowledge arose, illumination arose within me with regards to things never heard before, referring to the third noble truth. This is the noble truth of the cessation of stress. This noble truth of the cessation of stress is to be directly experienced. We experience the cessation of stress. It's, that's the point, to directly experience it. This noble truth of the cessation of stress has been directly experienced. Now he's referring to himself. Vision arose, insight arose, discernment arose, knowledge arose, illumination arose within me. Again, with regards to things never heard before. 
This is the noble truth of the way of practice leading to the cessation of stress. This noble truth of the way of practice leading to the cessation of stress is to be developed. Guess what he's pointing to, the fourth noble truth? This noble truth of the way of practice leading to the cessation of stress has been developed. So he's telling his friends, and, and again, the, one of the most amazing things to me is these teachings are still just as pure and effective 2,600 years ago, as they were 2,600 years ago. He's telling me and all of us clearly the truth of stress is to be understood, and the way that we do that is to develop the Eightfold Path. Monks, as long as my knowledge and vision concerning these Four Noble Truths was not pure, I did not claim to have directly self-awakened. He had enough self-honesty and uh, a small enough ego to understand that he, didn't, he wasn't there yet, so he didn't declare anything. And it's important to note that the, the Siddhartha Gautama didn't teach one single thing until he had everything to teach. In other words, he didn't, he didn't teach a, uh, he didn't teach something just to be a spiritual teacher, which everybody was doing during his time. He waited until he had something to actually teach. I did not claim to have directly self-awakening. My self-awakening is unexcelled in the cosmos even, and now he's, he, he's pointing to something that was common during his time and still common today, the belief in disincarnate so-called higher beings, gods, deities, etc. With its deities, its maras, its brahmins, and its contemplatives and brahmins, its royalty and common folk. He's saying that his, his understanding is beyond any of that, of the, these legendary disincarnate beings. But as soon as my knowledge and vision concerning these four noble truths was truly pure, then I did claim to have directly self-awakened, an awakening unexcelled in the cosmos. Knowledge and vision arose in me unprovoked is my release. It's an interesting use of the word. And what it means here is that there's nothing provoking his, con his continued ignorance. He's freed himself of all ignorance. Unprovoked now is his release because there's no ignorance left in him. He has released. He's no longer clinging to wrong views. Unprovoked is my release. And then put another important line. This is the last birth. So the Buddhist is referring to physical birth, but the more important thing, is, and in the context, is there's nothing left, unprovoked is his release, there's nothing left rooted in ignorance to give birth to another moment rooted in ignorance. That's the most important teaching that the Buddha gives on rebirth. Not a future physical birth, but to, to empty myself of ignorance so that there's no possibility for me to give birth to manifest another moment of ignorance in my own life. Because why? Because ignorance leads to suffering. So <clears throat> the phrase um, unprovoked would have been how we should have answered your questions. <laughs> that how, how, how would we feel when we have such a calm and peaceful mind? That feeling is a mind unprovoked. Yes, let, let me, let me just, not to correct you, but just because that's so important what you're saying. A mind that has no craving or clinging in it is an unprovoked mind. There's nothing to provoke craving and clinging. There's no, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, my problem, our problem as human beings is we provoke ourselves to stress. The Salata Sutta. We're the ones that are doing it. It's not, it's not because of a, a, a mistake of birth or, or a misapplication of karma or punishment for something. It's not because a God forgot me for a few minutes and left me to, to fend for myself. It's not because I haven't prayed enough and gotten a God's attention to take care of me. Unprovoked is my release. There's no condition on my suffering save for what I bring into my own life. Is that clear? And so the Buddha is teaching us and through these four noble truths that it's all up to us how we experience our life. Sickness, aging, death, not getting what we want, getting what we don't want isn't up to us. That's, that's a consequence of having a human life. How I respond or react to that life is, is up to me. 
And if I gain control of my thinking, the Vitaka Santana Sutta, we gain the ability to think what we want to think, when we want to think it, meaning whatever is appropriate for now, for what's occurring, I'm awakened. There's nothing to provoke anything rooted in ignorance. I'm free. Free of what? I'm free from my own ignorance. Again, I'm not free from some arbitrary system or some mystical prison I find myself in. I'm free from my own ignorance. That's the whole point of the Dhamma. Does everybody get that? So when there's stress and suffering in your life, recognize because it's not something you're seeing clearly and practice restraint there. But it also doesn't mean we should judge ourselves harshly. In fact, it's just the opposite. A person who judges themselves harshly is deeply rooted in ignorance. This underlying feeling of self-loathing that most of us have, even if we don't recognize it, is rooted in ignorance. It's not, there's nothing valuable in judging ourselves harshly. In fact, it's, it, it's the uh, most common manifestation of ignorance. Why? I, ignorance manifests as I'm not, not getting what I want. I need more, I deserve more. And it also is, I should be more. No matter how wonderful you might find yourself to be, in, meaning in a, a position in society, you're never happy with it, are you? You always have to be more. And you, that, that more is an imagined, imagined self. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. even, even holding myself out, I, I, it has nothing to do with you, Frank. For some reason, I keep using the term the world's greatest baker. Even thinking to myself, I am the world's greatest baker. Even if it's true, even if it's acknowledged, it's something in my imagination, isn't it? It's a, it's a, it's a fabricated view of who I am because I'm not the world's greatest baker, even if I am. Do you see? I'm not, the, I'm not a baker at all. That happens to be what this, this being is doing, but it doesn't describe me, does it? This world's greatest baker has the same six qualities as the world's poorest baker. There's no difference. There's no significant. Um, there's no significant difference between this human being and that human being, you or me, in that sense. We all have different roles, but the roles don't define me either. Don't do that. It's in my head that I create those kind of divisions between me or separation between me and other people. Unprovoked is my release. This is the last birth. There is now no further becoming. So the reason why I titled the book Becoming Buddha, Becoming Awakened is because it relates directly to this teaching and dependent origination where the Buddha teaches in those 12 links of, causative, of, of causation. Excuse me. Bert. That from clinging and maintaining. Excuse me. From clinging and maintaining comes becoming. In the context, it means from clinging and maintaining comes becoming further ignorant. When I start integrating the Eightfold Path, then I have a choice that I didn't have up until that point. As I de deepen my concentration and refine my mindfulness to hold in mind the Eightfold Path and nothing else, then I have the, the opportunity to become awakened. And so each and every moment then holds the potential to either become further ignorant or become awakening, awakened. And that really is the only choice we ever have. We have to do a lot of other, other things as, a, as a human beings. We're involved in a, a, a you know, various, almost endless list of things we need to do and want to do. But the one thing we have to do or, or should do and keep our focus on is awakening in this moment. Because it is in this moment in a mind united in its body that the opportunity for awakening occurs. It's not, and we can, we can fall into that trap even in, within this practice, is that if I meditate long enough and come to enough classes and listen to that crazy old bald guy, sometime I'll, I'll awaken in the future. You need to let that go. Be mindful of what's occurring, and if you're not quite awakened yet, that's to be noted. That's all. Come back to the sensation of breathing and start integrating more and more of the Eightfold Path. That's the Dhamma. Okay. talked about that.
I thought that I just want to go over some of my comments. Um, to, to conclude this now, this is what the, the Buddha said. The group of five, of five monks were delighted at his words. While this discourse was being given, Venerable Kandana declared, all conditioned things that arise are subject to cessation. Now, he's talking directly about impermanence, but he's also referencing the second mark of existence of the not self characteristic because he now understands that it is all the conditioned thoughts that I've created in my mind are all part of impermanence and subject to cessation. All conditioned things that arise, especially my views of myself, conditioning and ignorance, are subject to cessation, meaning they can change. I can abandon my, I can empty myself of them. When Kandana said that, the Buddha declared, you are now on a Kandana. You're one who understands. That, that one line points to the importance of, and the, the very specific type of insight we're hoping to gain. Again, insight into the three marks of existence. Not some generalized insight into everything that's occurring. That should be a consequence of a well-concentrated mind holding the refined mindfulness. But the insight we gain through the Buddha's Dhamma, the specific insight is into these three marks of existence. And that's leading to, I think, week six or seven, when, whenever we get to it. But that's important to hold in mind, too. They also have been pointing at uh, karma and that he was no longer subject to karma that karma was not something that was going to run its course but that yes. he that there there was a way to end it here and now yep that, that's a we'll get into karma and rebirth in a couple of weeks but ron is right this is another way of looking at karma karma is the present again wildly misunderstood term, especially the, the pop way, it's the pop culture way of using it. Karma is the present moment unfolding, what's happening right now, um, rooted in, in past intentional actions and moderated by the present level of mindfulness. Meaning that if, if I'm developing the refined mindfulness framed by the Eightfold Path, what's manifesting in my life right now will be seen from right view and will cause no further conditioning. And so I will gain that unprovoked quality of mind. If I'm continued in ignorance, my mindfulness, the quality of my mind impacting with what's occurring, maybe I should say relating to what's occurring in my life, will be seen <laughs> from wrong view and reinforce suffering. And so in that sense, my, my future karma will be based on my present moment mindfulness as well. An awakened human being no longer produces, I should say it this way, karma is not an issue to an awakened human being. It's not whether it's there or not. It's not because you're, you're not adding to it. It's, it's come to cessation. And so a person who is free of that type of karma will never give birth to another moment rooted in ignorance. Frank. This is a good place for, for us to exit. I just wanted to say that um, for me, it always comes back to right view. And um, I think when I really kind of understood what the Four Noble Truths were, because in the beginning I was trying to figure out whether they were true or not. And, um, <laughs> and I didn't realize that they were tasks to be engaged in. Yep. And, um, and I think at that point, I really started to have a different experience with the Eightfold Path and um, always kept coming back to where you and what Lorna said when you have a disturbed, when your mind is disturbed, you're in wrong view. Yep. Come back to right view. And that's with, that's just knowledge with regard to stress. Yeah. Knowledge with regard to the origination of stress, the experience of cessation and the integration of the Eightfold Path. And you know, it's a good practice. Yeah, it, it's just under, it really is understanding at a profound level what it means to be a human being, really. And, and, and what, what more could we really want? but to understand what we are in the environment that we find ourselves in. What, again, there, there may be something beyond human life, but we're not there. So why don't we figure out what's going on with right now? And that makes all the difference. Thank you, Frank. Okay. Eric, good to see you. Have a good night.
See you soon. Uh, and yeah, just to just to introduce, next week we're going to start on the Eightfold Path, um, and we'll be looking at the wisdom, virtuous, and concentration factors over the next three weeks. So, and you'll get an email about that. Are we going? Safe. Bye. Um, let me invite uh, Kevin first, because you're right up there. Where are you, Kevin? I'm going to unmute you all. Um, Kevin, welcome. Good to see you. Wait a minute. Uh, you're all, yeah, your your mic's open. How are you, Kevin? No. Ah, your mic should be open, Kevin. But I'm gonna move on. You hear me, Kevin? Shake your head if you hear me. Can you talk? Say something. Ah, okay. You can't get your mic on? Okay. Then I hear something. All right. We're, we're gonna, I'm going to start at the top and ask. Uh, I'm going to unmute Helen. How are you, Helen? Boy, nothing's working. Helen, do you hear me, Helen? Hmm. All right, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Okay, there, there we are. Uh, let me just say, Helen and Kevin, if you if you want to chime in, go ahead. I got your mics unmuted, so you should be able to talk. But Helen, uh, Sarah, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Fighting the flu. Ah. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I hope you feel better soon. It, it's much better with the eightfold path. I I assure you. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, any comments on tonight's talk? So true. It's just. Uh, it seems like the the proper normal, or I mean, I, I, I hate to put pass judgment on it, but the but just the right normal. <laughs> it just seems That's like crazy, it? yeah. <laughs> it just seems like the real normal. It is. It is. Uh, I'm glad you joined us tonight, um, Jane. How are you? Jane? I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> you uh, What do you think of tonight's talk? Uh, this was the first. Um, talk that I had listened to when I was, you know, when I first uh, oh. started. Yeah. Really special meaning for me when I hear this one. Yeah, me too. Me too. The setting and everything, how much, what it covers. So I'm glad you could join us tonight. I'm going to try Helen once more. Helen, can you, you want to have anything to say or can you? Uh, and Kevin again. Hi, Kevin. Yeah, I don't know why the microphones aren't working, but we will move on. <laughs> glad you joined us. Lorna, good to see you. Uh, it, it's just a fantastic thought, you know, the Buddha just after awakening and coming across these five bodies and, and actually putting out into the world for the first time that this has been developed, yeah. you know, the, the sensation of stress is possible to develop and understand. Yeah. Um, and this is the first words. I've been awakened. First time it's been spoken. Yeah. I mean, it's it's an incredible, incredible thought. Images that come to your mind and things. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. It really is. Thank you. Okay. Good to see you tonight. Thank you. Um, I don't really have anything specific to say. Um, I just think the first time I read the Four Noble Truths, I it was like you always say. I think it's so simple, but like. I don't know, just like it hadn't occurred to me before that like yeah. stress occurs, there is a way out of it. But I don't know, it just seemed like I'd never thought of it that way before. Yeah, and but I, I think I always try to like push stress away, you know, yeah. and just kind of the realization that it's going to occur. It's part of having a human life. Like just just accepting that, I think, just like helps you. Yeah, because that, that, that's a, a very profound understanding, Kate. The, the act of thinking you can push away or avoid stress really results in avoiding your own life. Mm -hmm. Rather than, and it, and it doesn't, the opposite, or the a mind can go, well, that, does that mean I should embrace stress like some people teach? It's just to understand it, that's all. It's what's occurred. I don't need to take any of these things seriously, personally mm -hmm. because there's nothing personal. And there's no avoiding it. Yeah, and so yeah. why even try? Right. Yeah, even the beginning statement, 
birth, sickness, aging, and death. You can't avoid any of them. If you have a human life, you know, you're, you're already missed avoiding birth and we're going to get sick. We're, we're going to age, you know, we're going to die. But it took an awakened human being to do, to say it because a human mind works like yours did previously to thinking you could manipulate stress in some way. That's the problem. We become preoccupied and distracted by stress when it's just there. So that's very profound. Thank you. Ron, good to see you. Good to see you again. Yeah. Yeah, just like uh, Frank, I, I, when I first uh, encountered them, uh, I was trying to find out whether they were true or not. Uh, <laughs> and, and I just missed the, uh, uh, the, the meaning of, of truth that you used there. This is how it is. Yeah. We don't have to believe that this is how it is. We just, that these are things to be seen and practiced. Yes, and they're noble because they're timeless. It says that in some other suits. It's a timeless path, meaning that stress is always stress. Craving always originates and clinging always perpetuates stress. It's possible to, to end our own contributions to stress. And the path is always the Eightfold Path. I mean, who knows? Maybe someone will at some point will come up with another path, but I haven't seen it yet. And this is the most direct, right. uh, and it's what was taught by the way, and it works. That's and, and it works. And yes, that's, that's another staggering thing to me <laughs> that that we're twenty six hundred years later, and it still works. It still works. It, it timeless, and it's just as simple then too. You know, now as it was then. You know, it's, not, yeah. it, it's not terribly complicated. Once you once you get tease apart uh, the, the, the timeline and, and you know how these things keep continually pointing back to each other uh, the, there's, there's a hole there yeah and uh, once you get a view on, on the fact that this is one thing uh, you have a working uh, a working network yeah you're, and you're so right and, and now you're when you realize it's, the, it's this one thing, then you're committed to this one thing and you're less likely to adapt, accommodate, or embellish it, mm -hmm. in which case you just, you lose the one thing. Right. And then it becomes two things or 10 things or you know different practices and yeah. different chanting and all the rest of that. Yeah. It's just as simple. Life, yeah, sometimes uh, there is the, the uh, sometimes I, I get distracted by other things going on, but Nowadays, it's like, oh, is it, is it the eightfold path? No, well, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know, somebody else can do that, but the, for me, this is working. And yeah, and I've gained control of my mind finally. I mean, I, you mm -hmm. know, I, I, I think about that a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, again, that I that it, it's worked for me. You know, and not that I'm so much, I'm no different than any, I'm, you know, I'm the six, I'm the Datu Vavanga Sutta too, the six properties. There's nothing extraordinary about me, but what's extraordinary about my life is that I came across these teachings, I developed them, and they work. That's remarkable. I mean, I, and I would say it's the first, now that I'm saying that, no, I won't go on too long tonight. In that way, it's the first truth I've ever encountered, meaning it's the first thing that delivered what it promised, mm -hmm. in, 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 whether in spiritual terms or practical terms. You know, I mean, I, I tried just about every method, spiritual method out there. They all just left me confused and, and frustrated, much like Siddhartha was at the end of his search. Somebody you know? told me a long time ago, and they were battering me with the whole idea of truth and all that. And he finally said, truth is that which works. Yeah. And this is, and it always works. It always works. So, thank you. Andrew, good to see you tonight. How are you? It's always good to hear this uh, sutta and it was enthusiastic when you presented. So, <laughs> I, I, I like that. And it just gives me uh, additional motivation to uh, um, to cease stress or try yeah. to cease. It is. It is just that. To some people, will say, "Well, why would I even want to bother with that?" And to understand that your our whole lives are preoccupied with it. So, I'm glad you're here. Please say hello to Judy. <laughs> Bonnie, good to see you tonight. Good to see you too. Um, I 
think holding on to the idea too, or um, considering, you said it maybe once or twice tonight, but we talked about more about um, the, the stress comes often because we're trying to make things not so. Yeah. Um, which leads to the craving and clinging or the distracting. Um, and it is, it, it, you can feel, you know, the stress rising when you get upset about something. And, but holding on to that has been really useful because you can't, you can't change the way things are. And I have a choice then about how to react or not react um, yep. when I can stand back from that. And it doesn't mean that I don't have the sensations of, you know, what's, what's arising. Yeah, but, um, it, it's rather like I'm not shoving myself in front of the traffic, you know, yeah. out of the way a, a bit more. So it's, you know, that's the practice, right? It is. Yeah, and that, that choice you mentioned is is gaining control of your mind. You, you know, you're thinking what you want to think when you want to think it, and that you know, isn't that wonderful. You know, we can finally do that. Um, great class. Thank you all for joining online too. Um, so next week we're going to start looking at uh, the eightfold path, uh, specifically the virtuous factors, right view and right intention. So you'll read that in the book. Um, I might review the. Uh, uh, right, right view and right intention are the virtues. What did I say? Oh, uh, <laughs> thank you. Right view and right intention are the wisdom factors. Uh, right speech, acts, and livelihood are the virtuous factors, and the concentration factors are right effort, right minute, right mindfulness, and right meditation. So we're going to look at those. We're going to separate them in that order. We'll look at right view and right intention next week. The wisdom factors. Um, Okay, let's, uh, let's finish as we always do uh, with meta. So again, find your relaxed meditation posture. Take a moment to become mindful of your in-breath and your out-breath. And these are the Buddha's words on meta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. <clears throat> Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class tonight. Thank you online too. Peace. Good night, John. Good night. Good night. <laughs>